But you're not more than one generation from poor wire trash, are you, Agent Starling? What comes to mind when we think of a character on screen as being quote-unquote white trash? The stereotypical portrayal is poor, rural, unrefined, uneducated, and often racist. A cardboard villain or a laughingstock. Hollywood has used this trope as far back as the 1930s for laughs, shock value, or to make other, richer white characters look better, overwhelmingly failing to honestly represent individuals of a lower socioeconomic class. So-called white trash characters have rarely been granted the nuance or humanity of their higher class co-stars and are often blamed as scapegoats for the bolstering of white supremacy, even though they're typically suffering due to their lack of means or education and aren't in positions of major societal influence. Today, more humanist stories are finally starting to change this picture. My whole entire life, I'd been told I wouldn't amount to anything. Well, you know what? Maybe I would. Here's our take on the evolution of white trash characters and the sneaky way that denigrating them has been used to reinforce upper-class white supremacy on screen. Somebody told me just now that uh, they thought that you believed Tom Robinson's story again, Iron. Well, they was wrong, wasn't they? I've been appointed to defend Tom Robinson. Now that he's been charged, that's what I intend to do. If you're new here, be sure to subscribe and click the bell to get notified about all our new videos. The phrase white trash originated in the 1800s around Baltimore, created by African Americans as slang to describe Irish immigrants and other poor, semi-skilled white workers looking for employment in America post-revolution. The expression picked up popularity in the South as a way for upper-class Southerners to categorize poor white Southerners who often suffered from various physical and social challenges like emaciation, discolored skin, or alcohol addiction as a result of their poverty. In 1853, white trash was mentioned for the first time in pop culture in a chapter of Harriet Beecher Stowe's A Key to Uncle Tom's Cabin, entitled Poor White Trash. Stowe believed the emergence of white trash in the U.S. was a result of slavery, which created a poor white population as degraded and brutal as ever existed in any of the most crowded districts of Europe. God damn you, I thought you knowed something! I did as instructed. If there's something wrong, it's wrong with the instruction. You goddamn black bastard. In the decades that followed Stowe, pop culture depictions of white trash effectively created the idea of an inferior white race, thereby reinforcing the notion that there is a supreme version of whiteness to be sought after. This is the takeaway of one of the earliest influential portrayals of white trash on screen in 1939's Gone with the Wind, which makes a clear distinction between the white upper and lower classes. Bring your mama home. When Scarlet's perfect lady of a mother, Ellen O'Hara, must report on the death of lower-class Emmy Slattery's baby. Your child has been born, has been born and mercifully has died. At first glance, it seems odd for Mrs. O'Hara, a Catholic woman, to respond this way towards the death of a baby. But with this comment, Ellen O'Hara is elevating her own status as a better kind of white person, one whose children were born under the correct circumstances, yet who is generous enough to show charity to and concern for her inferiors. On another level, her reaction even betrays how there was a fear among 19th century Southern aristocrats that corrupted whites, such as Miss Slattery's baby born out of wedlock, would cause their Anglo-Saxon race to degenerate. A more featured white trash figure in the film is bad woman Belle Watling, who's explicitly specified as trash compared to ladies Scarlett O'Hara and Melanie Wilkes. Go on, you trash. Don't you be pesting these ladies. Writer Chuck Stevens compares Belle to a walking vagina because of the alluring color of pornographic pink she is dressed in, again emphasizing the anxiety that lower-class white Americans would threaten the purity of middle- and upper-class whites. Through Belle, Gone with the Wind also demonstrates how the black characters are only allowed to scrutinize poor white Southerners as long as they are protecting the status of the upper-class whites from being brought down to the level of white trash. Who that? I never seen had that color before in my life. With the radical changes brought by the Civil War, the distance between Belle and aristocratic Scarlet is suddenly less great, and Scarlet fears having fallen to the same level as her former inferior when Belle becomes Scarlet's sexual and romantic rival for Rhett Butler. R.B. A. 
away, and she's driving away in Rhett Butler's carriage. Oh, if I just wasn't a lady, what wouldn't I tell that varmint? Yet, while Belle's good qualities as a person paint her as sympathetic, both the story and Rhett implicitly view Scarlet as innately superior to Belle. Even Belle herself respects the social hierarchy, which regards her as unworthy of consorting with ladies like Scarlet and Melanie. If you ever see me on the street, you don't have to speak to me. That wouldn't be fitting. In the 1960 novel and 1962 film To Kill a Mockingbird, intelligent, educated, and articulate attorney Atticus Finch defends innocent black man Tom Robinson against the false accusations of the white trash Yules. Through Scout's educated, thoughtful perspective, we learn of her father's failure to bring the other white citizens of their Alabama town up to his level of aspirational whiteness. There's a lot of ugly things in this world, son. I wish I could keep them all away from you. That's never possible. The story accurately pinpoints how the unattractive qualities of the Ewells and others like them are a result of the extreme poverty that affected white Southerners in the 1930s. We as poor as the Cunninghams? No, not exactly. Cunninghams are country folks, farmers. The crash hit them the hardest. But it's also worth bringing a level of skepticism to the story's portrayal of Atticus Finch as the white savior-esque hero of this situation. Harper Lee's father, Amasa Coleman Lee, whom Atticus Finch is based on, honored Confederate veterans, supported the prosecution of the Scottsboro Boys, and even opposed a federal anti-lynching law. While it's easy to watch To Kill a Mockingbird and place all the blame for the story's outcome on the white trash character's detestable racism and ignorance, if that's all the viewers take away from the story, a sneakier, subtler representation of white supremacy is left unscrutinized. Miss G. Louise, stand up. Your father's passing. 1998's Mississippi Burning falls into the same pattern of stories that utilize the white trash trope in order to serve a white savior narrative. The film represents the white community of Mississippi's Jessup County as second-class citizens who need to be set straight by FBI agents from the North, Ward and former Mississippi sheriff who left, Anderson. So we got two cultures down here, white culture and the colored culture. The rest of America don't see it that way, Mr. Mayor. Because the story focuses on the agents nobly swooping in with their superior white status in order to rescue the black characters, it fails those black characters, representing them only in the context of their suffering, with flimsy backstories and often without names. And the white trash characters function as antagonists not only to Jessup's black community, but also to Ward and Anderson's better whiteness. This is how elite white supremacy attempts to seduce. The blatancy of the racism of white trash characters masks and excuses any ways in which upper and middle class whites might be sneakily racist, while white viewers are invited to identify with admirable agents of a heroic whiteness. It's common for period pieces to offer up cartoonishly racist characters in a past era, thus allowing viewers to feel that they are not part of the problem, as there is no way that they're that racist. You'd kill Frank? Is that what you're saying? I wouldn't give it no more thought than wringing a cat's neck. And there ain't a court in Mississippi that'd convict me for it. By excluding subtler and systemic forms of racism that are still common today, these films fail to challenge white viewers to become more aware of how they are perpetuating racism and actively or passively upholding white supremacy in their own lives. Thus, white trash characters have been utilized time and time again on screen to elevate the status and dignity of higher class white people, while the black characters in these stories are reduced to pawns to be saved and protected, all ultimately in service of affirming the value of that refined whiteness. In light of this, a key part of what made Mad Men fascinating from 2007 on was that it was really an interrogation of elite whiteness. The story of Don Draper's rise from poor white beginnings to becoming a successful Madison Avenue ad man who feels like a fraud is, according to show creator Matthew Weiner, a tale of becoming white. That's the definition of success in America, becoming a wasp, a wasp male. But I do know what it feels like to be out of place. There's something about you that tells me you know it too. When the white trash character isn't a one-dimensional villain, they're often a laughingstock. That's my credo, no regrets. 
Movies like We're the Millers, Poor White Trash, and Joe Dirt picture poor, uneducated Americans for comedic effect. And typically, it's their trashiness that's the butt of the joke. And that went into a dive on account of something went wrong with my semen. They said we had to wait five years for a healthy white baby. Comedies that involve likable white trash portrayals often feature those characters outgrowing their class status in tales of self-improvement. Across the pond, My Fair Lady follows Henry Higgins teaching Eliza how to present as a refined, upper-class lady. The film underlines that he's wrong to overlook Eliza's value and see her as his creation, yet it's only really after her class transformation that he or the audience is encouraged to view her as a serious person worthy of our deep respect. You not only danced with a prince last night, you behaved like a princess. Thus, while outside of the context of racism and the southern United States, ultimately the dynamic is again demonstrating an elite whiteness to be sought after. Similarly, in Pretty Woman, sex worker Vivian Ward begins as a smart and special person, but her value can only be fully realized in her life and her story when her upscale client Edward Lewis falls in love with her and teaches her how to overcome her white trash branding. Until then, her perceived trashiness makes other characters see her presence as a threat to the prestige of their environment. Look, I got money to spend in here. I don't think we have anything for you. You're obviously in the wrong place. Please leave. Sometimes white trash comedy is about the humorous clash between a higher and lower class white person. Baby Mama and Friends use the surrogate or adoption process as a plot device to bring together an elite white woman and a lower class white woman. Oh. Did you just stick your gum under my coffee table? I don't know. At first, the white trash character is mocked and othered, before the stories eventually show this divide being bridged. But again, this largely happens through the lower class white character gaining an education of sorts via this relationship, which allows them to achieve more awareness and sensitivity and overcome their more extreme white trash tendencies. I want to thank you. I didn't like it sometimes, but you made me grow up. I know I was supposed to help you have a baby, but you ended up teaching me how to be a mother. Ultimately, it's important for comedic portrayals of poor working class whites to not lose sight of the humanity of those characters. Shameless is built around deriving comedy from the often shocking life events of a poor white American family who, on the surface, check off almost every characteristic of the classic white trash trope. We're gonna white trash this shit. And sometimes gleefully embrace the problematic stereotypes. People say, you can't drink your troubles away. I say, you're just not drinking enough. But it shows immense sympathy for its characters and pays tribute to the strong family bond they've formed in their adversity, even at times bordering on romanticizing their poverty. The show is purposefully not in the South or other rural areas of the country, as showrunner John Wells wanted to emphasize that families like the Gallaghers live four blocks down from you and two blocks over. Most importantly, it realistically dramatizes how the Gallaghers strive to overcome their circumstances but usually fail to because of the impossible cards they've been dealt. The ghetto girl thinks she can live the American dream, huh? The second oldest child, Lip, is pretty much a genius and initially seems set up for a goodwill hunting type rise when he gets a college scholarship, but the bad habits he's learned and inherited lead him to self-sabotage and he's sucked back into the Gallagher orbit. Some filmmakers have long been showcasing the humanity of poor white characters. When Spring Breakers director and kids screenwriter Harmony Corrine was filming 1997's Gummo in poor neighborhoods of Nashville, his crew demanded hazmat suits as a condition for being in these locations, so he and the film cinematographer wore speedos and flip-flops just to piss the crew off. British director Andrea Arnold masterfully makes viewers feel for the struggling working class female characters at the center of Fish Tank, American Honey, and her Oscar winning short Wasp. And Jennifer Lawrence's breakout film, 2010's Winter's Bone, directed by Deborah Granick, portrays the oldest child of a broken Missouri family showing dignity, intelligence, and resilience in desperate conditions. I'll find him. Girl, I've been looking. I said, I'll find him. On TV, from 1988 on, the sitcom Roseanne was the rare show that treated self-described white trash characters as decent, relatable, and witty. We got two, count them two, daughters in college. Yeah, we're gonna have a lot of explaining to do at the next white trash luncheon. <laughs> In the 2000s, shows like Friday Night Lights conveyed that characters like Tyra and Tim Riggins may not have a lot of options in their Texas small town, but still have a lot of value and dignity as people. 
Breaking Bad, starting in 2008, is about a working-class white man, Walt's resentment over his disappointing lot in life, while his partner Jesse and some of Jesse's pals display certain stereotypically white trash characteristics, but are portrayed in an endearing light. From 2015, Schitt's Creek showed how much a once-rich family can learn about being fulfilled human beings from the poor white town they initially consider far beneath them. A part of me feels like I'm almost glad that we lost the money. The 2016 election of Donald Trump was a wake-up call for the white liberal elites who'd been dismissive of the power of white, rural, working-class people to shape the country's future. And this sudden awareness was a seeming catalyst for a new wave of more three-dimensional, humanized white trash representation on screen. In 2017, I, Tanya, The Florida Project, and three billboards outside Ebbing, Missouri all put quote-unquote white trash characters at the center of their stories, but with a shift in the typical narrative to display more nuanced, complicated illustrations of working-class white people in America. You know what? I, I never apologize for growing up poor, being a redneck, which is what I am, for being the first U.S. woman to land a triple axle. Sean Baker's The Florida Project uses the honesty that comes from a child's point of view to present an authentic depiction of poor characters that overflows with humanity and heart. Oh, and no one uses the elevator because it smells like pee? The man who lives in here gets arrested a lot. More somber moments capture how Mooney's mom, Hallie, struggles to take care of herself in Mooney due to her youth and unemployment, but her poor choices in no way lessen her love for her daughter. Also starting in 2017, Ozark has gone further than the earlier show it's often compared to, Breaking Bad, in exploring the tragic events of generational poverty and doing justice to the complex feelings and personalities of its poor white characters. And 2021's Panic celebrates a poor young white woman who summons incredible inner strength in part because she's been written off by the world. You're nothing, everyone told her. John Waters once called white trash the last racist thing you can say and get away with. Even though we are getting more and more stories of poor white characters who are fleshed out and deviate from stereotypes, in some ways, elite white contempt for and stereotyping of lower class, less educated white people is more ferocious than ever due to our polarized political landscape. Proving this mood, Appalachian poverty tale Hillbilly Elegy went from being hailed by critics in 2016 for capturing the zeitgeist of Trump's rise to being, in its 2020 film adaptation form, panned by critics who seem to have, in those few years, realized that the story's ethos, which largely blames individual laziness rather than policy and systems, didn't align with liberal values. She just up and quit. She just stop trying. But you, you gotta decide. You want to be somebody or not? Yet as tempting as it is in today's world to dismiss people who you strongly disagree with politically, reducing people to one-dimensional white trash stereotypes in storytelling or life is ultimately self-serving, dehumanizing, and inaccurate. And since it's the elite, upper-class white people who hold most positions of power and influence, it's really their less obvious forms of white supremacy and the systemic racism, classism, and exclusion they preside over that need to be more heavily scrutinized as we continue to depict whiteness in film and television. Representations of disadvantaged white people must stop serving the narrative of a supreme high-status whiteness and instead focus on depicting a significant demographic in the United States with respect and dignity. Trashy Tanya doesn't belong. Your own mother doesn't think so. Yeah, yeah, you suck. This is the take on your favorite movie shows and pop culture. Thanks for watching and don't forget to subscribe.